And if you're joining us by uh, Facebook today, you're very, mo you're very welcome. Um, the talk today, the title, if you like a title, is The Moth and the Lion. But before I start, can we just pray? Lord, years ago you used your prophet Hosea to speak to your people. And I just pray, Lord, today for your anointing on this word. Speak to your people. Use me, Lord. May people hear your voice and not mine. And I just pray, Lord, that all who hear this message will be touched and blessed by you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's the whole chapter, really, but particularly verse 15. Then, sorry, Hosea chapter 5 and verse 15. Then I will return to my place until they have borne their guilt and seek my face. In their misery, they will earnestly seek me. Well, it's God speaking here. Have you ever thought about this verse before? It seems to have been just written for today as it really describes the current state of our country. Whilst this has thankfully not happened to me, but I've heard from others that it has happened to them, as you know, relationships take working at especially marriage. Anyone here been married? Stayed married? Jolly hard work, isn't it? <laughs> Guys, so I am told, are especially bad at telling their wives that they love them. Is that right, ladies? Huh? They often wrongly think to themselves, I bought her a wedding ring how can she want more proof that I love her? Perhaps it's only when the wife packs up her things and goes back to her mother that some guys come to their senses and go and beg her to return. I rather think that today God is rapidly vanishing from our lives. Our churches are empty there are shortages of Christian workers and Christian values and morals are almost a thing of the past. The govern government may pass laws to change things, but these laws don't change people. Yet I believe that many Christians, and I thank God for this, are earnestly these days seeking revival. In chapter 5 in the book of Hosea, the prophet's special message was delivered to the priests, to the people, and to the king. It was a national word to Israel, but it came through the religious leaders. Its burden was that of national pollution, and as is a consequence, divine judgment was falling on the nation. But what was the background to this intense gloom? It was simply that Israel had rebelled against God, and even Judah was in danger. Today, America is in danger, and England follows close behind. Hosea had previously linked Judah with Israel, on two other occasions. He had warned the southern nation against any alliance with Israel, as he said in chapter 4 and verse 17, Ephraim is joined to idols. Leave him alone. It's obvious that Judah was not obedient to his warning. She had been entering into league with Israel and even worse, seeking help from Assyria. There was a political arrangement 
between the northern and the southern kingdoms in an attempt to save them from what they supposed to be uh, what was supposed to be the impending calamity so we can see in this message while it was specifically first addressed to the northern kingdom hosea twice included judah in what he had to say the historic background of this period reveals terrible decadence in both israel as well as in judah in the light of this hosea was warning the nations of discipline in judgment and the predicted judgments are progressive two of these judgments are described as figures of speech the first is found in verse 12 i am a moth to Ephraim and the second comes in verse 14 for I will be like a lion to Ephraim and the last warning the worst of all then I will turn to my place until they have borne their guilt and seek my face so the first judgment is described as that of the moth that little insignificant insect the moth which nevertheless finds its way into the wealth of the east and destroys it the root of the word moth can be traced to both hebrew and greek cultures from where the bible draws a lot of its teachings the hebrew term for moth denotes to fall away just as the garments eaten fall away references in scripture can be found in isaiah chapter 50 and verse 9 hosea 5 and verse 12 and job 4 and verse 9 among other verses the greek meaning of moth can be found in the new testament verses of matthew 6 verses 19 to 20 and Luke 12, verse 33. Here, the destruction is not caused by the mature moth, rather by larva, larva the, the, of the cloth moth. Righteous men gain favour before the Lord, but those who do not abide by the laws and the statues end up being punished. Nowhere does this come out clearer than in Hosea, Hosea chapter 5 and verse 12. Therefore, I am like a moth to Ephraim and like rottenness to the house of Judah. The message coming across is that God slowly punishing the two tribes because of their sins and lack of repentance all the other verses including psalm 39 and verse 11 symbolize and speak of the gradual destruction or punishment as a result of god's wrath activated by sin the second picture that of a lion rampant angry and tearing the bible uses hundreds of metaphors and images to describe the indescribable God Almighty. Animals and other forms of nature can help us understand aspects of God's character. Jesus is called the Lamb of God, John 1 verse 36, to illustrate his gentleness and willingness to be the sacrifice for our sins. But he's also called the lion of the tribe of Judah. Revelation 5 and verse 5. To display his absolute authority and power over all creation. A lion may be king of the jungle. But the lion of Judah is the king of kings. And then the last 
and the most terrific of all, God. It's almost unbelievable to think God withdrawing himself. Then I will return to my place until they have borne their guilt and seek my face. In their misery, they will earnestly seek me. Oh, I hardly like to tell you, this is a solemn warning. There could be nothing more solemn. The moth is a terrible thing. The lion is a terrible thing. Oh, but when God withdraws himself, it is the most terrible calamity of all that could take place. I wonder if we're starting to see this today in our country. However, we must notice that this solemn warning ends on a note which reveals the divine heart and intention of God. The first part of the warning may fill our hearts in terror. I will go and return to my place. Then comes the little word, the striking word, till. And in that little word, we discover God's divine heart. And as we read on, we discover God's divine intention. I will go and return to my place. But that is not my will or my desire for, for what I want till. Till what? Till they acknowledge their offence and seek my face. Then the divine word sings the song not merely of hope, but of assurance. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. So, we have the most solemn warning, and coupled with it, a revelation of a method of the going, and a final word which reveals the very heart of God. To those two matters then, and in that sequence, let us give some further thought. Let us consider the seriousness of this warning and the terrible calamity threatened, and then the method in which the warning was given as it reveals the very heart of God. It surely is a strange word that God has given to his people here, that he would leave them and withdraw himself and return to his place? If you study theology, you would come across the term, if I can't pronounce it, anthropomorphism, which is a term used to ascribe human characteristics to God. So God is speaking under the figure of himself as a man departing and returning to his place. The meaning is perfectly simple in one way. It means that he who had been present with them will withdraw from them. This presents us with a challenge, as in a sense God is always present. Whatever the wickedness and whatever the rebellion there's a sense in which his presence is never, and reverently, let me say, cannot be withdrawn. In the very nature of his being, that is so. The actual presence is inescapable. The government of God is always active. He holds the world in his hand. He holds you and me in his hand. His withdrawal does not mean that he's giving up his government. We must make sure we, under, we fully understand this. There is a powerful example of this later in the history of the Jews, in the story recorded in the book of Daniel. I expect that we're all familiar with this story. When 
Belshazzar, with thousands of his lords, were drunk when they had desecrated the vessels of the temple which had been taken by them and until then kept with a certain amount of holiness, filling them with wine and drinking from those vessels until they were drunk. There came the writing on the wall. Mini, mini, tekel, uprising. Which in Daniel's interpretation means, that's Daniel chapter 5 and verse 23, but you did not honour the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. From this passage, we have a sense that God had withdrawn himself and calamity was coming. But in another sense, he had not withdrawn himself. Your breath, the breath of Belshazzar, foul with drink and obscenity, the God in whose hand your breath is, there is a sense in which God is never separated and never can be. There's a sense in which his government never ceases. For even when he says, I will withdraw myself, he's still acting in government. This is a truth which lies at the heart of all life, which we should never forget. No man can escape the government of God, not even President Bison or Boris Johnson. We speak about men being rebels and rebellious. They certainly are. They are in revolt against high heaven, lifting the blasphemous fist of wickedness and punching God in the face. But they never escape from his government. So there is a sense in which God is never withdrawn. For in him we live and move and have our being. In his hand is our breath. So what does it mean? Surely it's self-evident that it means he would withhold himself in guidance. He would leave, it, leave, leave us to follow our own desires. He said, I will go and return to my place and so allow you to go all the way that you're travelling. I'll raise no fresh barrier against you. I'll go and return to my place. Such withdrawal is the ultimate and awful calamity that can ever overtake a nation, a man or a woman. For if God withdrew his interference, what have we lost? We've lost the principle of holiness, the certainty of absolute wisdom, sufficient strength for the accomplishment of anything worthwhile, and ultimately, oh, we've lost love. Have you noticed there's not much love left in the world today? This makes me think this, this message is so bang up to date. It grieves me to give it. If God withdrew himself, we may still attempt to set up standards of conduct by the consideration of circumstances. It's called situation ethics. And they will break down, for unless the spirit of holiness breathes through our ethical standards, we perish. The illustrations of this abound in human history, and some are being worked out today in front of our very eyes in America. In the Biden administration. When God withdraws himself, then man has lost the true and only interpretation of holiness. And so the demand for holiness ceases. When God is withdrawn, men begin to declare 
that there is no such thing as holiness or sanctity of life. Just look at the rise of euthanasia and the number of abortions today. We're hearing, aren't we, that there is no such thing as sin. Huh? His teaching has almost been lost. Even, I dare hardly say it, even in our churches today, when God is withdrawn, the very distinction between right and wrong has gone. When Henry Ford first invented the Model T Ford in the year 1908, he made it without any locks, as no one would have thought to have stolen it. Today, it not only has locks, but it's fitted with immobilizers and anti-theft alarms and, and more. I gather that in the city of Manchester, there are on average over 800 crimes committed every single day. Have you noticed everything requires security passwords? I know, because I'm always forgetting mine. And even then, we get hacked. Morality is rooted in religion. When I was a child, it seems a long while ago now, my late father, who was a clergyman, often had visiting speakers to stay at the rectory. One of these was a pioneer missionary, a man called Frank Train, who in 1920 had been a missionary in Argentina. I remember him saying, along with other things, that when people there were to swear, that they would not say like we do in England, in court, on the Bible. No, they would just say, we swear on the word of an Inglese. Swear on the word of an Englishman. Now that's amazing. You see, at that time, the only Englishman that they would have ever met would have been the, the simple English navvy who built the railways and the canals. When once religion, and I'm using that word in its high and proper sense, as the binding of man to God and the holding of man in right relationship with God, whenever religion has perished, morality withers and dies. It becomes the sport of the comic papers, the butt of brilliant articles in magazines, the ridicule of philosophers who are without God. Holiness is at a discount. God says when that happens, I will withdraw myself. Is that happening today? Oh, brothers and sisters, it grieves my heart. But is God disappearing from our country and from our world? When God does that, the vision and the passion for holiness perish. Again, wisdom is lost. This is almost unbelievable as we live in an age which boasts of its knowledge. We have exchanged wisdom for knowledge. Could this be one of the reasons why we find so little common sense these days? Is knowledge ever wisdom when it shuts out of its calculation at any point in human life and in any consideration the same factor of knowing God? That's the key to life, isn't it? Knowing God. Can we actively... Uh, can any activity of the human mind lead mankind towards the goal of human well-being if God is eliminated? All such activity is foolishness. And worse still, 
It's madness of the most destructive type. Oh. If, if God withdraws himself, it's equally true that strength is withdrawn. There's a certain vitality in the human mind and body, but if the spiritual centre of life is dead, both the mental and the physical wither, the scripture reminds us, don't they, that man cannot live by bread alone. Perhaps the worst thing of all, if God removes himself, love will perish. St. John was right when he said, God is love. Sadly, much of what is called love these days is self-centred and so lacks the vital principle which is central to the love of God and was the very reason of that self-emptying which brought Jesus Christ to Calvary for you and for me. So, what do we learn from this prophecy in Hosea and in the light of all the biblical revelation and in the light of all human history? We're taught, are we not, that God never leaves man until man has left him. Or put it in very simple language, God never leaves man until he has exhausted every method of discipline. As we have seen in this prophecy, first the moth, then the lion, and only when these fail does God withdraw himself. The moth then, delicate, lacking in terror, but weakening strength and resulting in decay of chivalry, this is the act of God intended to provoke us, to make us more aware of our weakness so that we can rediscover our true source of strength. The text says, I am unto Ephraim as a moth and to the house of Judah as rottenness. The disaster was that Ephraim did become conscious of his weakness but did not return to God. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, then Ephraim, would you believe, went to Assyria. The failure was with them. The purpose of the discipline of, of the moth was not that of making the nation know its weakness, but that they might seek the source of its strength. And it did have that effect. But they went to Assyria instead of returning to God. Then God said, I will take another method. I will become as a lion, as a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will carry off and there shall be None to deliver. The judgment of swift and sudden, terrific calamity followed. What for? Still in order that the nation might be brought back to him. Then, if this fails, when every method of discipline is exhausted, then the final and the terrific one is inevitable. God himself will withdraw. I will return to my place. God leaves man only when there is no hope, when there's nothing to which he can appeal, when there is no avenue of approach, when every point of contact is destroyed. Can a mother ever stop loving her child? God cannot. It destroys him. 
It does. Oh, do we feel the pain of our Lord as we hear this message today? How desperate, how desperate he is for us to return. None of us are capable of being able to fully understand the age in which we live. But if we look back in history, we can gain a valuable perspective. Nevertheless, it is impossible not to see in this prophecy light flashing here and there upon the present conditions of our age, whilst we can understand our own country better than any, than any other all of us must wonder, what is God doing in America today? If we look back over recent years, I'm conscious of the method of the moth by the evidences of weakening of our national character. And sadly, I fail to see that there has been a return to God. Then came those terrific years of the lion and the young lion of appalling calamity and catastrophe. And I wonder, like you, are these things bringing us back to God? If they are not, then we stand nationally in danger of this judgment of God, that he may leave us to our own devices. Our very love of our nation and our devotion to their, highest, to their highest welfare must make us almost distressingly conscious of our peril and must compel us to prayer that this thing may not happen, that God may not withdraw himself. But we must not forget that he never does leave man until man has left him. In Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19, we're reminded of these words. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. God never gives up man until something has taken place in the, in the individual soul or in the condition of the age or in the national life that has destroyed the possibility of contact. Remember again, God said, I will go and return to my place. Why? because Israel and Judah had left him in spite of every attempt to hold him. God never leaves us until we leave him. He employs various methods of discipline, every one of them intended to save us from disaster and bring us back. But there comes a moment when there's no response then it is inevitable, not of his choice, but of our own, that he leaves us. But thankfully, this is not the end in that solemn and dread hour when to Israel and Judah, by the prophets Hosea and also Isaiah, the case seemed hopeless that God withdrew himself he did so with a note of hope. We find this same principle in all the other prophets in the Bible. For example, in Ezekiel, we find God withdrawing himself from the temple and from the people, but return and restoration are in view. With God, the door is always open. Do you remember we looked at that little word, till, earlier. It has a powerful meaning in the New Testament, which I want to read now. The passage is Matthew 23, verses 37 to 9. We all know it, I'm sure. 
Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. God on the page of the Old Testament, God on the page of the New, abandoning a nation, abandoning a city, abandoning people. Why? Because they would not have him. It says, I would have gathered your children as a hen gathers her brood beneath her wings. But you would not. Therefore your house is left unto you desolate. Notice the the caustic irony in your house, the temple. He had previously described it as my father's house, but at last he called it your house. No longer God's house, as in the days of Hosea, Bethel, the house of God, had become Beth Haven, the house of vanity. Your house is left unto you desolate. There has to be another sermon here, but can it explain the downfall in recent years of the church in this land? But is doom the last word on the lips of Jesus? Certainly not. You shall not see me henceforth till the door is open. The warning ends on a note revealing his willingness to return. Let's return to Hosea. He tells how God will come back. He said, I will leave you till. When will he return? Will he indeed come back again? The God continually refused, broken hearted by the faithlessness of his people. He's bound to leave them by the necessity of holiness and of love. When will he come back? Till they acknowledge their offence and seek my face. So it's clear that when they seek my face, That is when they return to God. When Paul was writing to the Thessalonians, in the first book of Thessalonians, he described the whole of the Christian life by saying in chapter 1 and verse 9, they tell you, sorry, they tell how you turned God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. When man turns back to God, God turns back to man. I want to end today with a lovely story. It deeply affected me. I heard some time ago of a young man who was travelling on a train. And in the carriage with him sat a clergyman. The clergyman noticed that the young man was agitated and asked him what was wrong. The young man told him that he had been away from home for a long, long time and wondered if his parents would welcome him home. He had written to them, and asked if they were happy to see him, if they would hang a white sheet from a branch in the apple tree in the garden. The young man was afraid to look, so the clergyman offered to do it for him. And guess what? His parents had hung sheets from every branch of the tree. I did preach a few weeks ago, some of you may have heard, on Hosea chapter 6. 
and verses 1 to 3. I'm not going to give you another sermon, but I just want to end by reading those verses again. Because that's what this is all about. God wants us to return to him. If you haven't marked it in your Bible, do mark Hosea 6, verses 1 to 3. This is what it says. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. Can we say amen to that? Fantastic. Well, if you've been watching on Facebook, please share, tell others. This message has got to get out. It's not my message. It's God's message. He longs to see this nation return to blessing. Thank you for watching. And do please pray for the ministry here. And uh, if you ever want to get in touch, I would love to hear from you. God bless.